Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be talking about an ad click aggregator. Uh, I personally have been doing a lot of advertising recently for my OnlyFans channel. Now you may be thinking, Jordan, I've never seen one single Jordan Has No Life OnlyFans. I actually go under a stage name called Sophie Rain, so if you've heard of that one, that's actually me. Uh, separately, I'm going to keep being shameless about this. Uh, if you want me to start responding faster to comments, uh, consider joining the channel membership. Otherwise, all the videos are free. You can still comment. I'll still probably respond at some point. Uh, and yeah, let's go ahead and get into the video. Oh boy, I kind of have to poop again. Let's go get through this. Today we'll be building out a metrics counting platform for advertisements. Though this one is technically focused on ads, it's really just a continuation of the tiny URL video. Basically, as users either click a short URL or an advertisement, we want to be sure that we can provide advanced analytics to the creators of the content. With that in mind, let's formalize our functional requirements. The first and only necessary requirement is that every single click of an advertisement should be tracked and that users of our service should be able to perform arbitrary analytical queries on the data. Those queries should return us insights as fast as possible. For this video, we'll also list two non-functional requirements. The first is that we should be able to query time series click metrics on advertisements on a per minute granularity and have those return extremely quickly. Another non-functional requirement is getting data liveness to be within a few seconds. That's to say, within a few seconds of a user clicking an ad, I should be able to see that click reflected in my queries. Let's stick with the numbers that we used in our tiny URL problem. From that video, we estimated that there were 10 billion clicks per month to keep track of. Converting this metric to a per second basis, we can see that we need to handle almost 4,000 clicks per second. Before we break down the exact reasons for all of our choices, let's map out our high level design. This flow all begins when a user clicks an ad and triggers a request through one of our load balancers and into one of our application servers. The load balancer can use a round robin policy because all of our servers are completely stateless. The first thing that we do when receiving a click is check if we've seen it before. This network call to our duplicate click database helps us protect against malicious users who might click an ad many times to try and earn more money from their site. If the click isn't malicious, our application servers then persist it to our Kafka cluster. We have consumers reading this data, batching it up into parquet files, and performing a bulk insertion into our data warehouse. Our users can then query that. Keep in mind that in a problem like this one, we want to give advertisers as much information as humanly possible. The data that we may track may include the ad ID itself, the ad campaign ID, the user ID, the IP address, user device information, the page that they came from, a timestamp, and more. All in all, I think it's pretty fair to say this is a few hundred bytes worth of information, but to be safe, I'll cap the data size at one kilobyte. That means that per second, we're producing four megabytes of data, and on a monthly basis, we're producing 10 terabytes of data. That's almost as much data as I shoot out after a few days of not being able to beat it. Given that the modern server can comfortably store a few hundred terabytes of data, we aren't constrained to using an object store to support this inflow of data, and can add database nodes to our cluster as we need to. In the event that we were producing many petabytes of data per month, we certainly might be forced to use one. Many people might propose using a typical transactional database like DynamoDB for a problem like this one. That way, we can just write clicks to the databases they're created and easily query them back. This approach has an issue. Such databases may not actually be able to support the necessary write throughput. In the case of Dynamo, for example, a single partition can handle up to one megabyte per second of writes. In theory, we should never run into this problem, right? We could just partition our database so that ads are split across partitions based on their advertisement ID. That makes a big assumption, which is that all ads are clicked equally. That being said, if Corinna Kopf advertised free OnlyFans subscriptions, that could be responsible for the majority of the traffic. This has been coined the celebrity problem. The typical solution for this is to basically repartition the data for these popular ads in order to spread it across many shards. We could do so by adding some random suffix to the ad ID and then aggregating back later. Another option would be to just round robin clicks to partitions over a database, assuring better load balancing. But then fetching all clicks for a given ad would be quite slow given we'd have to read from all partitions. In my opinion, both of these solutions are pretty poor. Let's explain why. If we want to handle a lot of writes from a single server, we can use Apache Kafka. Kafka is a log-based message broker, meaning that each piece of data is just appended to the end of a log file on disk. Because the disk head only has to move sequentially, as opposed to randomly, writes can occur super quickly. In practice, a topic partition in Kafka can handle more than 50 megabytes per second, which is more than the entirety of the load produced by our clicks. Hence, we really don't even have to worry about the celebrity issue for now, let alone partitioning. 
Another great thing about Kafka is that we can configure our cluster to ensure that messages are durable. Kafka has settings to make it so that messages are only considered valid once they've been persisted on multiple up-to-date replicas. At the bottom of the slide, I've attached some settings which will ensure that we have three copies of the data per topic partition and require the data to be replicated to at least one of the replicas before a message is considered valid. Finally, the last toggle ensures that if our leader does go down, we'll never fail over to a replica that isn't completely up to date. While this may sound like it would make Kafka super slow, these messages are replicated in batches, greatly amortizing the cost of the operation and allowing write throughput to remain high. From Kafka, we need to sync our messages into some sort of system that allows us to store and run expensive analytics queries on our data. In this case, we generally want to opt for a data warehouse or a data lake house. In contrast to your typical transactional database system like MySQL, the data warehouse stores data in a columnar format. Compared to row-based storage, this results in us storing all data within a table column together on disk. Given analytical tables often contain many columns, but the queries only require reading a few, this allows us to just access the subset of columns that we need, thereby reducing the number of bytes that we read. Storing all columns sequentially on disk also leads to better compression ratios, since these values are more similar to one another. Finally, operating on data in column batches, as opposed to one row at a time, enables better CPU cache rates and parallelization of SQL operators via SIMD instructions. There are many options amongst OLAP data warehouses and data lakes. There are open source ones and cloud offered ones. Some of them use object stores to hold their data and others store their data with local disks on the nodes that perform query computations. I'll inevitably also get some folks who are going to ask about time series databases in the comments. These are a great choice too, especially when we wanna see ad clicks over time. That being said, not all time series databases support running arbitrary SQL queries, so I'm going to stick to a generic OLAP data warehouse here. We've already spoken about how we're sure that messages won't be lost from Kafka. After our consumer reads a batch of messages and puts those messages into the data warehouse, it lets Kafka know its last consumed message offset. This way, if the consumer goes down and comes back up, it can resume from where it stopped. However, what we may see now is a situation where the consumer puts data in the data warehouse, yet fails before it can report its new offset. We're now faced with an issue. We may insert the same row into our database twice. One option to play things safe would be that when our Kafka consumer restarts, it checks the latest row in the data warehouse from that particular Kafka partition. It then drops data that it gets from Kafka in the meantime until we reach a higher offset than the ones persisted in the database. This strategy implies we'd need to persist each row's Kafka partition and offset in our data warehouse. It's worth noting that if our data warehouse supports upserting, all of our writes would be idempotent and we wouldn't have to worry about this edge case. However, in many modern data warehouses, using this functionality implies that we must first check for matching rows in the table on each upsert, making the average operation much more expensive. Insertions, on the other hand, just add a file into the storage system and update some metadata to note that the file is now part of the table. Personally, I'd rather just pay a small penalty on Kafka consumer startup to avoid much slower data ingestion. Let's imagine that we had many users running a query that showed them the number of clicks over time for their particular ad. We could very easily run an aggregation query over all of our data. However, as we build up data over time, this may take longer and longer to run. If we know the minimum bucket granularity that our clients are using to see the data as a time series, we can optimize for this. Maybe our clients request to see the data at a minimum granularity of a minute. In our case, we can run a batch job every single day at say three in the morning to aggregate the prior day's data in one minute intervals and sort it by timestamp within each ad ID. We can then take this output and persist it as part of a second table called minute data. Would that mean that we would have really poor data liveness in that view? Yes, but we can fix that. When querying for minute by minute data, we can combine the results of our materialized view with an ad hoc aggregation over the raw click data. Since the aggregation is basically limited to one day's worth of events, it should be very fast. Most modern data warehouses support some concept of sorting. They may call it clustering. Internally, we can sort by ad ID and timestamp to make these queries as fast as possible. In theory, a malicious user could click the same advertisement many times from the same site. How can we avoid counting all of these as distinct clicks? What we basically need is a source of truth. I could have really used one of these when I was dating my ex-girlfriend because she gaslit the shit out of me. 
One possibility is deduplicating data in our data warehouse. This one again forces us to do something like upserts, which while functional, could significantly decrease our ingestion throughput. Let's think about the fields that would probably determine whether an additional row of click data would be a duplicate. Some might include the page URL from which the ad was clicked, the IP address, the ad ID, and the time at which a user entered the page where the ad was clicked. We can hash these fields to create a key that allows us to figure out whether a click is a duplicate. We can check whether we've seen this click in the past before, before we actually forward the data to Kafka. We can do so with fairly low latency by just using a normal transactional database. If the row isn't present, we insert it in the database. If it is, it's a duplicate click. Since we're using hashes to determine our item potency key here, we can easily scale this across a cluster of database nodes. The hashes should be evenly distributed, meaning that we don't really have to worry about hot shards. In theory, if someone was really spamming clicks on one ad and potentially causing a celebrity issue, they could be stopped by an IP-based rate limiter well before they even reach the database. In our design from before, we could probably get away with just using one partition of our data warehouse and Kafka topic. That being said, it's almost inevitable that an interviewer might be curious how we would scale out a design like this. After that, we'll touch upon how we can not only make the queries fast, but also ensure that users have access to their data as soon as possible. When thinking about scaling out our system, we should consider what we're actually looking to accomplish. In our case, we want to maximize the speed of users' queries. One important question to answer here is figuring out what the majority of those queries are looking for. Our clients may want to click breakdowns per ad, per advertising campaign, which is a grouping of ad, or even just by the advertiser ID. To keep life simple, let's assume for now that it is the ad ID, though the logic here would be the same regardless of which one of those it actually is. In our analytical database, we'll want to create partitions where all rows for the same ad ID are in the same partition. The reason that this benefits us is data pruning. If a user is only interested in the stats for one advertisement, they only have to read from the relevant partition, and we can skip reading all of the others, greatly decreasing the number of bytes to read. Pretty much all analytical databases support the concept of partitioning in one way or another. Some, for example BigQuery, only support doing range-based partitioning. Others, like ClickHouse, can take a hash of your partition key, modulo the number of partitions, in order to determine which one a row should be sent to. If we really want to scale out our application, we'll also need to create many partitions of our click data Kafka topic. When determining which partition a message goes to in Kafka, we have a few options. We can use round robin partitioning, we can choose a partition by hashing the Kafka message key, modulo the number of topic partitions. A third option is actually just going to be manually assigning it ourselves from code. Should we use round robin partitioning? If our main concern is Kafka being overloaded due to hot shards, maybe this is the best approach as it guarantees load balancing across all of the partitions in our topic. Personally, I'm not really very concerned. Again, a single Kafka partition can handle easily 50,000 or more writes per second, meaning that our service can handle an order of magnitude more data before we should even begin to worry. For us to get overloaded, literally every single click would have to go to one advertisement, and even then we could vertically scale the hardware running our Kafka brokers. One important thing to know about data warehouses is that they typically perform better when data is uploaded to them in large batches. This is for a few reasons. For starters, fewer files of data mean that query engines have less overhead when determining all of the files to read for a particular query. The same applies when compacting data in background jobs. Compacting a bunch of super small files uses additional resources, which leads to extra costs for us. Bigger files can also take advantage of better compression more than smaller ones. If our Kafka consumers have a different partitioning schema than our data warehouse, then each one will be uploading smaller batches of rows to each partition of the warehouse. This is less efficient. Ideally, we want Kafka consumers to be handling all of the data that arrives for a single partition of our data warehouse. This way we can provide the largest batches of data to our warehouse when ingesting it. If we're passing in parquet files, for example, one large file will be compressed much better and result in much less network and storage overhead than 10 smaller ones that each contain one tenth of the rows. For this reason, we actually want to partition our Kafka topic in an identical way to how we partition our data warehouse. Whether it's hash-based, range-based, on ad ID, campaign ID, or advertiser ID, all data from one Kafka partition should go into a corresponding partition in the data warehouse. There are data warehouses that can support single row insertions for better data liveness, but we'll discuss these later in the video because doing so often has consequences on read performance. 
If we have many Kafka partitions and the load on them is sufficiently high, we'll likely need many Kafka consumers in order to handle the data. If one of our consumers goes down, we need to ensure that our cluster of consumers picks up its leftover partitions while also not resulting in any duplicate or missed data. This problem is easily solved by Kafka consumer groups. When a cluster of consumers is set up with the same consumer group ID and configured to read many topic partitions, Kafka can evenly distribute the assignment of partitions to each consumer. Every time that a consumer pulls in a batch of data from Kafka and writes it to the data warehouse, it can commit its last handled offset back to Kafka. In the event that a consumer goes down, its topic partitions will be assigned to other members of the group and they will start reading the Kafka queue from its last committed offset. As we mentioned before, it's possible that a consumer will put data in the data warehouse but crash before it's able to commit its offsets. In this case, when another consumer takes over that topic partition, we just need to ensure that we read from the data warehouse to get the highest committed offset from that topic partition and then drop any data in our consumer until we surpass it. An industry standard for the size of persisted parquet files tends to be somewhere in the 256 megabytes to one gigabyte range. If we're making 4,000 one kilobyte writes per second, it would take us a bit under five minutes to persist a gigabyte of data to Kafka. Converting Avro serialized row-based data from Kafka to Parquet files can often result in a 2 to 10x decrease in file size. In that case, let's flush our data to the data warehouse every 10 minutes or so to hit our target file size. This means that for 10 minutes, our queries won't reflect recent clicks. Is there anything else that we can do instead to mitigate this? While the implementation details are specific to each data warehouse, many offer the ability to insert data a row at a time and have it available to be queried almost immediately. How does this work? Under the hood, it very much resembles our typical log-structured merge tree architecture. Data is sent to the data warehouse in a row-based format and buffered either in memory or as a file on disk. During this time, it is available to be queried. Because the data is in a row-based format, this slows down our analytical queries. However, the amount of data that's actually being buffered is small enough that we're not paying a huge penalty when querying it. In the background, as this buffered data builds up, we can perform a compaction job to convert it into our typical columnar files. Depending on the data warehouse, this may just be managed directly for us. An example of a workflow like this is very well supported by the Apache Hoodie table format. We can persist small Avro files to the table every few seconds, which we forward directly from Kafka. In the background, after 10 minutes, we might run a Spark job to aggregate those Avro files into a one gigabyte Parquet file. Well guys, there you have it. Thanks for sticking around for video three. Uh, I think in the next video, we're gonna start getting into the social media aspect of things a little bit more. Maybe I'll do one of the newsfeed videos, uh, which is probably gonna take a while. But yeah, as always, please leave any feedback or comments on things to improve. I really appreciate you guys sticking around for this long if you are here. And uh, thanks again, it's a pleasure to do this and I'll see you next week.